I'm really happy to be here. Thank you so much to Marco and Jörg for inviting me. Um, I have to leave fairly soon after my talk, and on the plane here I was thinking this has got to be one of the stupidest decisions I've ever made, to kind of like come all the way to Germany for five hours of conference. However, I'm really glad I did, not least because I get to meet Peter Van Inwagen and Richard Swinburne for the first time on the same day, so, you know, that's all good. Um, but also, it, I've used it as an excuse to revisit uh, two of my favourite papers in Free Will, uh, which are these two. Uh, David Lewis's Are We Free to Break the Laws, which, uh, as Peter says, is, I can't disagree with this, the finest essay that has ever been written in defence of compatibilism. Uh, and he also says, this is in a 2008 paper, says at the end, here's my closing piece of advice for compatibilists. Study Are We Free to Break the Laws Carefully? That's the way to be a compatibilist. Um, I'm not completely sure that's the way to be a compatibilist, but I'm pretty sure something like it is the, the way to... Uh, deal with the consequence argument if you're a compatibilist, and that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, and the, w one of my other all-time favourite papers on free will is uh, Van Inwagen's reply to Lewis's paper uh, called Freedom to Break the Laws. Uh, one reason why it's one of my favourite papers on free will is that it displays a virtue that uh, we in philosophy could display more often than we do, I think, which is uh, to take your opponent on their home territory. So it's a paper that, rather than, as people tend to do, think of the consequence argument as a potential knockdown argument that completely refutes compatibilism, and now we can argue about whether it succeeds or not. Uh, that's not Lewis's view, which he talks about at some length at the first half of the paper, is that you never, you almost never get knocked down arguments in philosophy, right? That's just not way, the right way to think about the way philosophical argument works. And Lewis's positive view, as he describes in the introduction to Philosophical Papers, Volume One, is because there are no knockdown arguments, as it were, we're going to end up with different people occupying different. Uh, sort of global positions in philosophy and the best we can hope for is to bring all of our own opinions into equilibrium um, and one thing that you have to do when you're bringing your position into equilibrium is consider the challenges that are raised by other people's arguments and think about whether your view has some consequences uh, that you're not prepared to tolerate and hence require you to revise your opinions in some way and that's the spirit in which Van Inwagen takes uh, are we free to break the laws right it's uh, okay, uh, maybe I haven't given a knockdown argument here, but we need to think about what the cost, what the burden of cost is on someone who wants to buy the Lewisian response. So that's one of my, my favourite papers on free will, because it um, does that in a really nice way. So, uh, and Van Inwagen, uh, in highly Lewisian spirit, claims that the price of compatibilism is too high, uh, since it entails that deterministic agents are able to perform miracles. That's his basic uh, worry. Now, I disagree about that, um, but I absolutely know I'm not going to convince any incompatibilists to adopt a Lewisian response to the consequence argument. That's never going to happen. Uh, so I'm sort of interested in what the underlying source of the disagreement is in all of this. Um, I don't think the compatibilist is saddled with something that's completely unpalatable, but um, there's still a question about as it were, what the relevant costs and benefits are on both sides. So that's the thing that I'm going to get to uh, towards the end. And I'm going to ask about whether there's a price for the incompatibilist. I'm basically kind of going to conclude that if you're a, well, at least if you're a certain kind of incompatibilist um, and reject Lewis's uh, response to the consequence argument for a certain kind of reason, we really have just kind of entered into a sort of stalemate situation at that point. Like, I really just don't think there's anything to be said on either side um, uh, that is going to make the other side feel remotely inclined to uh, revise their view on this. Um, and reasonably so, right? It's not like one side is being completely unreasonable and intransigent. OK, so I'm not going to uh, spend very much time going through this. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. Here's the consequence argument. If determinism is true, then the full packs about the distant past and the laws entail that I had toast for breakfast. Actually, I didn't have toast for breakfast, but let's pretend I did. Uh, uh, oh, sorry, it should be P0. Uh, facts about the past and the laws entail that I had toast for breakfast, but I was unender, unable to render false the, that fact about the past. I was unable to render false the fact about the conjunction of the laws. 
So I was unable to render false their conjunction. So I was able to render false the consequence of that conjunction, viz. that I had toast for breakfast, conclusion. I was unable to do otherwise than have the toast. Uh, what I'm going to focus on is the I was unable to render false the conjunction of the laws past, part, uh, because that's what Lewis's focus is. So I'm going to fairly quickly run through Lewis's response for those of you who are not familiar with it. Uh, so uh, Lewis's uh, view, as enshrined in that paper, has come to be known as local miracle compatibilism. Uh, and the view, it's. <sighs> It's not really a compatibilist position. I mean, in particular, he doesn't give us a story about what abilities are. He says a lot about what abilities we have and don't have, but he doesn't tell us what it is to have an ability. So as it were, it's not a theory, but it is a, a, a way of responding to the consequence argument. So Lewis's line goes like this. Look, that premise, I was unable to render false the laws, is just ambiguous. Uh, there's a weak reading of the premise, which says, I was unable to do anything such that had I done it, a miracle would have occurred. Lewis thinks that premise is, if read that way, the premise is just false. Uh, there's a strong reading of the premise. I was unable to do something such that had I done it, my act would have been or caused a miracle, right? So rather it being the case that a miracle would have occurred, in fact, it, a miracle would have occurred slightly before I did the action. Uh, uh, I was unable to do anything such that had I done it, my act would have been or caused a miracle. Lewis thinks that premise is, uh, read that way, the premise is true. Uh, so now, if we read the premise in the weak way, it's false, so the consequence argument is perfectly valid, but it's just unsound, it's got a false premise. Uh, if we read that premise in the strong way, fine, the premise is true, but it renders the consequence argument invalid, Lewis thinks. Um, because it just doesn't follow from all the other premises together with the claim that I was unable to do something such that had I done it, my act would have been or caused a miracle that I was unable to do otherwise. Why is that? Well, because I, it's not true that I was unable to do anything such that had I done it, a miracle would have occurred. Right, so disambiguate that premise, and then either way you go, you end up with an argument that's unsound. Uh, so here's the idea. Um, there are two kinds of abilities that agents might have. Uh, you might have the weak ability, the ability to do something A, such that were I to A, a miracle would have occurred, but prior to A, and so uh, it's not uh, a miracle that would have been my act or any of its effects. That's an ability that Lewis thinks that deterministic agents do, in general, have. Uh, or you might have a strong ability, which is the ability to do something A, such that were I to A, A itself, or an effect of it, would be a miracle. And Lewis thinks we don't have any strong abilities. Right, that's the idea. Uh, so now, this is kind of just uh, uh, a rehash of what, uh, roughly speaking, all you need to know about Lewis on counterfactuals to make this all work out. Question, what would have happened had I not ate at tea, had I not had toast at 8 o'clock this morning? Well, um, what would have happened had I not had toast at 8 o'clock this morning is what did happen at the closest possible world where I did. Sorry. Oh, what would have happened if I hadn't had toast uh, is what did happen at the closest possible world where I did have toast for breakfast. I've just flipped it between a and not a sorry. Uh, so, what is that closest possible world where I ate like? Well, the past of that world is exactly the same as it is at the actual world until just be before the time in question, just before 8 o'clock. Uh, it might be um, until just at the point where I was thinking, actually, I have toast, and I'm not sure. Um, and then a divergence miracle happens at that world uh, so that uh, the, the actual world's laws are violated in that world, right? There's a, there's a small blip in the actual world's laws. So the actual world's laws are not the laws of W, right, because uh, they're not even true at W, um, uh, but up until then, you know, the, the past has been exactly the same up until that point, um, so that divergence miracle M is incompatible with the actual world's past and laws, uh, thereafter what happens is that that world W proceeds as per the actual world's laws, so kind of like the laws are all the same at W apart from this little blip, uh, and the past of W is exactly the same as the past of the actual world. Thereafter, it's going to kind of diverge more and more thanks to that little blip, right? I have toast. I have toast in my stomach. There's one less slice of bread on the table. The other guest at the hotel gets really irate because there's no toast left and complains to the manager. And so it kind of like, you know, uh, spreads out. So that's what the closest world is like where I uh, didn't have toast for breakfast, right? Uh, okay. 
Uh, so assuming determinism, there has to be a miracle at that world. Uh, right, so I end up doing that as a consequence of uh, W's past and laws. So, uh, Lewis accepts that we lack strong abilities, right? The ability to do something such that if I did it, I would be performing or cause to happen a miracle. Um, but he thinks that we do have weak abilities. I, I was able to have cereal for breakfast. That's to say I was able to do something such that had I done it, a miracle would have occurred just beforehand, um, and that would have resulted in me having toast for breakfast. Uh, sorry, cereal for breakfast. Uh, so I could have rendered the conjunction of the actual laws false in the weak sense. Right? I could have done something such that had I done it, the actual laws would not have been true. Here's Van den reaction to Lewis's... Uh, line of argument. Then the basic gist is this, the price of compatibilism is just too high, so he's trying to saddle Lewis with a, a, a consequence that, I take it the idea is, look, that should be unpalatable by anyone's lights, you know, whether you're a compatibilist or not, just like, you just can't suck that up. Uh, so, here's part of what he says, free will in a deterministic world strictly implies the ability to perform miracles. The compatibilist believes that there are deterministic worlds in which agents have free will. The compatibilist must therefore grant that in all such worlds, all free agents are able to perform miracles. The compatibilist must grant that in a deterministic world, freedom is freedom to break the laws. Now, if you just stare at that particular passage, having familiarized yourself with Lewis's re response, you might think that that's quite an, uh, an odd thing to say. Um, it's not immediately clear what is going on at first. So the first thought we might have is, well, look, uh, the whole point of Lewis's paper, which is after all called, are we free to break the laws, is that the answer to that question, are we free to break the laws, is you know, yes and no. It depends on what you mean by breaking the laws. Are you talking about uh, having the ability to do something such that were you to do it, a law would have been broken, or are you talking about the ability to actually perform a miracle. Uh, and Lewis thinks there's a sense in which we are free to break them, right? We have weak abilities and a sense in which we aren't. We don't have strong abilities. So to say that freedom to break a law is a consequence of self-compatibilism is kind of just to ignore that distinction, you might think. Um, moreover, you might, again, think that the whole point of that distinction was to avoid the conclusion of the consequence argument without having to accept that free will and deterministic world strictly implies the ability to perform a miracle, right? Since the ability to raise one's arm is in normal circumstances the ability to do something that requires a miracle, but not the ability to perform a, mi a miracle. So you might worry that, as it were, what's happened is that Van Inwagen has just kind of like ignored the central distinction of Lewis's paper, but um, that's not in fact what's going on. Uh, so here's Lewis's kind of definition of a miracle. A miracle is an event that's inconsistent with the actual laws. Right? So there are no miracles at the actual world. Uh, but there are miracles in other worlds, in, in other worlds, i.e. there are things that happen in other worlds that violate the actual world's laws. Uh, Van Inwagen thinks that that definition is just too weak and ought to be replaced with the following definition. A miracle is an event or state of affairs whose occurrence would be inconsistent with the whole truth about the past and the laws of nature. Now, you can see where we're going with this. Once you've got that definition on the table, uh, what you've done is just collapse that distinction that lies at the heart of Lewis's response. Assuming determinism, raising my hand is going to turn out to be the performance of a miracle, according to that definition, right? No different to running faster than light bending spoons, all equally miraculous. So now what's the argument for the claim that we should abandon Lewis's conception of a miracle and go with Van Inwagen's conception of a miracle? Um, it goes like this, long quote, suppose that Elijah, who's currently in Jerusalem, claims that he's able to be in Babylon 10 minutes from now. Suppose further that we, his audience, are able to convince him that the laws of nature and the whole truth about the past together strictly imply that he will not be in Babylon 10 minutes from now. Then surely Elijah must either withdraw his claim to be able to be in Babylon in 10 minutes from now or else claim to be able to perform a miracle. For that is what his being in Babylon in 10 minutes from now would be if the past and the laws together entail that he's not going to be in Babylon 10 minutes from now. It would be a miracle. Uh, it would be a mistake to insist, this is still Van Inwagen, it would be a mistake to insist that a miracle should be defined as an event whose occurrence would be inconsistent with the laws of nature to court, which is exactly how Lewis defines it. Imagine, he says, this exchange. I can perform miracles. I am, for example, able to be in Babylon 10 minutes from now, says Elijah. Respondent says, oh, that wouldn't be a miracle. A miracle is an event that contradicts the laws of nature. And your being in Babylon 10 minutes from now is consistent with the laws of nature, for the laws of nature don't have anything to say about who is where, when. 
It would be a miracle though, right? So, here's the thought. Look, uh, Lewis's definition of miracle, inconsistency with the laws, is just too narrow. It makes Elijah's claim to be able to be in Babylon in 10 minutes' time fail to count as a claim to be able to perform a miracle, since Elijah is in Babylon at time t, t plus 10, doesn't contradict the law of nature, right? So not a miracle according to Lewis's view. Um, but it is uh, a claim um, that, uh, it, it is the claim that he's able to perform a miracle, right? So uh, we need to reject Lewis's conception of miracle and adopt the more uh, uh, Van Inbargen's conception of a miracle, which of course renders everything deterministic um, uh, uh, agents uh, don't do as uh, involving miracles, right? So doing otherwise really is always going to involve a miracle. So now I'm going to give a really, really quick response to this. I actually think there's a lot more to say about this than I'm going to say, um, and I'm making it all seem much more straightforward than it really is, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to skate over it very quickly. Um, uh, so, surely right that there's a common sense sense of miracle according to which Elijah's ability to be in Babylon in 10 minutes' time would be miraculous, right? I kind of want to grant that. But is that really inconsistent with Lewis's notion of a miracle? Um, and I think it's not. I used to think that he was completely right about this. Um, and in a paper that I wrote about the same time, I've got a kind of alternative uh, definition of what I think what I call a law-breaking event, which exactly... Uh, uh, is trying to capture those cases of like being in Babylon in 10 minutes time that are not, as it were, uh, miracles according to Lewis's definition but need to be distinguished from raising one's arm. Um, and I'm sort of now slightly inclined to think that that's more complicated than it needs to be. So I'm going to go for the more straightforward response. Look, our topic's the ability to perform miracles, right? Being in Babylon at time T is just not an action, right? It's the upshot of whatever action Elijah thinks he's able to perform that's going to get him to Babylon in 10 minutes, even though he's now in Jerusalem. Perhaps Elijah thinks that he can, by sheer power of thought, dematerialize from his current location right now and rematerialize in Babylon in two minutes or five minutes or 10 minutes' time. Perhaps that's what he thinks he can do. He's just going to go, ah, oh, kind of like Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. Um, and that's somehow going to work out for him. Um, those actions, dematerializing and rematerializing, getting anywhere by the sheer power of thought, would be miracles, right? by Lewis's lights, contrary to the actual laws of nature. Um, contrary to the actual laws that someone spontaneously disappears from one place and then reappears somewhere else, assuming determinism. Maybe not assuming indeterminism. So, Elijah's inability to get to Babylon, right, conceived as an action, to perform whatever action would be required for him to be there in 10 minutes' time, is the inability to perform a miracle, given Lewis's story about miracles. So, when Elijah says, I can perform miracles, I am, for example, able to be in Babylon in 10 minutes from now, uh, I think we can reasonably interpret him to mean, it's very odd, interpreting a fictional character, uh, we can reasonably interpret him to mean that there is some action he's able to perform that will result in that state of affairs, um, and such an action would indeed be miraculous. Um, that doesn't seem to me to stretch common sense anywhere near breaking point, right? So when he says, I'm able to be in Babylon in 10 minutes from now, we think of him as saying, I'm able to do something that will result in me being in Babylon in 10 minutes time. That's making a claim that you're able to do something miraculous. Okay, so I claim, and I say this is all a bit quick, it's more complicated than this really, I claim that the justification Van Inwagen gives for adopting his definition of a miracle is that... Uh, one that makes anything that violates the past and the actual laws miraculous, doesn't succeed. So Lewis is right that conceding that deterministic agents are able to perform miracles is not a price that the compatibilist must pay, right? You only have to pay that price if you think that deterministic agents are, are able to get to Babylon in 10 minutes' time or uh, run faster than light or whatever. But Lewis doesn't think that, and compatibilists in general don't need to think that. However, I do not for a second think that any incompatibilist who buys the consequence argument is going to be convinced that they should therefore endorse a Lewisian response to the consequence argument. I'm not that silly. So, what is going on? Um, what is the incompatibilist resistance to adopting um, or to accepting the Lewisian response? That's the question that I'm really interested in. So, now I've put this bit very badly, um, <laughs> which is why there's something written on the board over there. So, set aside the talk of performing miracles. Uh, any compatibilist response to the consequence argument 
that d involves denying the relevant premise, viz that one, I'm unable to render the laws false, uh, is obviously going to have to claim that in some sense I am indeed able to render L false, right? That's just the denial of L. Now, I take it, and I'm genuinely interested to know what incompatibilists in the room think, uh, that the nub of incompatibilist lack of enthusiasm for local miracle compatibilism, or in general that kind of compatibilist response to the consequence argument, is that denying L is just absurd in and of itself. It doesn't matter how much fantasy, fancy footwork we compatibilists do to try and make it seem less nuts, it's just crazy. But, so I know the, the talk that you get in Van Morgan's paper about miracles is kind of as if we're trying to kind of make that this is all just absurd point stick, but I think the fundamental thought is it's just absurd to deny that, right? I, it doesn't matter what you say after that. You've kind of lost me. At, I'm unable to render l force. Um, so let's think about the costs and benefits of accepting versus rejecting that premise. So question for incompatibilists, and as I say, I'm very interested in uh, the answer. What is it that you think is wrong with denying L? Now, any compatibilist denial of L is going to ex involve accepting two claims. This is what I'm going to... This is a much better version of... This is what I should have said. Uh, Here's what I got on the handout. Uh, oh, sorry, on the slide. If I'd aid, the laws would have been right. So Lewis's response has two components, right? The first is, look, if I'd aid, which I didn't, the laws would have been different. And second, I was able to a. Uh, think of that as a slightly sloppy rendition of that. Look, there's some possible action a, such that first of all, a is incompatible with the person and the laws. Second, if I'd done A, the laws would have been different. Third, I was able to A, right? Uh, Lewis thinks all of those three things are true. If you're an incompatibilist who wants to defend the consequence argument, uh, obviously you're going to agree with the first thing, right? There is some possible action that's incompatible with the past plus the laws. Uh, me raising my hand just now. Uh, of course, you're going to deny the third thing, right? You're going to deny that, that I was able to raise my hand just now. Um, kind of what I'm interested in is the status of that second claim. If I had raised my hand just now, the, the laws would have been different. Um, so that's one here. So, and it seems to me that there are two ways you could go as an incompatibilist at this point. First of all, you could say, all right, look, what's wrong with that is that it's just false to say that if I'd done A, the laws would have been just the same as they actually are. Uh, in other words, you might think, look, the laws just don't counterfactually depend on what we do, right? They're kind of fixed. Uh, and if I'd done something differently, the laws would have been just the same. Uh, if anything had happened differently, the laws would have been just the same. Uh, so that might be, as it were, uh, I mean, obviously, you're going to object to the uh, compatibilist because you're going to disagree about C there. But uh, you might, as an incompatibilist, disagree with B as well, right? You might think that the laws are not counterfactually dependent on what we do. Um, right. Or you might think, all right, look, fear of counterfactuals is what it is. Perfectly true to say that if I'd raised my hand, the laws would have been different. Fine. Uh, but that just kind of gives me reason to think that I wasn't able to raise my hand, right? Because that would be an ability to do something. Uh, that would make the laws be different to what they actually are, right? We're not able to break the laws. Um, so the idea here is kind of like, look, okay, look, the laws do counterfactually depend on what we do. That might sound weird, but it's okay because we're never able to realize the antecedents of those counterfactuals. So if I say, look, if Donald Trump uh, ran a sub nine point, what's the world record? 9.7 second, 100 meters, he'd be the world record holder. Now, that claim's true. It's a completely uninteresting claim, right? It doesn't say, and it's true of all of us, that if we ran a 9.7 second, uh, 100 meters, we'd be the world record holder. Uh, really boring. Why is it boring? It's kind of boring because Donald's manifestly unable to realize the antecedent of that counterfactual. So a counterfactual is just not a very interesting counterfactual, right? It's just counterfactuals that have antecedents that people are not able to realize are just generally speaking very dull, right? They don't tell us anything interesting. Uh, if you uh, uttered that counterfactual and you were talking about, I don't know, one of those people who isn't quite the world record holder, that would be a more interesting thing to say, right? Uh, so 
The question is, uh, if you're an incompatibilist, you want to defend L, what's your attitude to that second claim? If I'd well, B on there and one there, if I'd raised my arm just now, the laws would have been different. Do you want to accept that claim? Uh, uh, and as it were, use that as a reason for uh, uh, saying that you were not able to uh, raise your hand, or do you want to... Oh, yes. Or do you want to deny that claim on the grounds that the laws don't count to actually depend on anything that anybody does? Let's take those two in turn. So, remember, uh, the first reason went, OK, look, that claim's just... Oh, the first way to go is to say, look, that claim is just false. If I'd aid, the laws would have been just the same as they actually are. Uh, we, the laws don't count to actually depend on what we do. It would be weird to think that they did. Um, so if I'd raised my arms now, just now, the laws would have been just the same as they actually were. Presumably, if you think that, you're also going to think more generally that the laws don't depend on what happens, not just on what people do, but on what happens. So if my watch had just stopped just now, for example, the laws would have been just the same as they actually are. So, and that's a, actually, that's a, if you take, go away from the free will literature and look at some of the literature on uh, laws, uh, that sort of claim that sentences like one are just in general false gets wheeled out as an objection to a kind of Humean view about laws of nature, right? So uh, you get people who don't like Humeanism about laws saying, yeah, it's this consequence of Humeanism that um, sentences like that come out true, and that's just weird because obviously they're not true. So, now, if you deny that claim, uh, fine. Uh, you're doing something that's inconsistent with Lewis's response to the consequence argument, since that's part of his response, is to assert that claim. Uh, so on the one hand, you've got a response to Lewis, splendid, uh, but it's also consistent with Lewis's whole theory of counterfactuals. Right. Uh, if Lewis, on Lewis's view, if determinism is true, then for pretty much any non-actual P, uh, my watch stopped just now, I raised my hand just now, uh, whatever it is, if P had been the case, the laws would have been different, right? Take pretty much any contingent fact about the world, um, uh, negate it. If the negation of that fact had been the case, the laws would have been different. Uh, if I'd raised my arm just now, if Elijah had been in Babylon, in terms of my watch had stopped just now, the laws would have been different, all the same. Uh, but I'm overstating it slightly, but you know, uh, the only sensible account of counterfactuals on the table is the Lewisian account. That's the one there is, according to which that claim is true. So, um, there is the fixed laws account where you vary the whole past rather than the laws. Uh, I, I'm not going to talk about that. You can ask me about that in questions if you like. Um, so now, if your reason for denying the Lewisian response is, or your main reason is that you think that that counterfactual is false, right? You think that the laws don't counterfactually depend on what people do. Um, here's my question. Do you have a count theory of counterfactuals that works under the assumption of determinism? I suggest you don't. Uh, and I think that is a major cost of your view if you want to take that route, right? We don't know whether determinism's true. We indulge in counterfactual talk all the time. Uh, you don't have a theory of how that works. Uh, we really ought to have a theory that makes sense of it. Okay, so one kind of compatibilist response, uh, incompatibilist response to the Lewisian uh, objection to the consequence argument, I think, does get you into trouble. There's a cost to be borne there. However, there's the other way to go. Uh, so let's think about that one. So on this way to go, you say, okay, all right, theory, counterfactuals, fine. I'm going to suck that one up. It's true that if I'd raised my arm, the laws would have been different, fine. Uh, but <laughs> given that had I raised my arm, the laws would have been different, uh, obviously it can't be true that I was then able to raise my arm, right? Because that would be tantamount to saying that we're able to break the laws and nobody can break the laws. Um, now, I think that's the point at which we hit stalemate, right? I, there's nothing, I think, for the compatibilist to say at this point um, uh, that will persuade the incompatibilist or vice versa. So the compatibilist is just going to say, look, I'm not saying we're able to break the laws. I'm just saying that we're able to do things such that were we to do them, a law would have been broken. That's not the same thing, right? I refer you to Lewis's uh, distinction. Um, the incompatibilist, I assume, sees this as, a, I think this is the nub of it, the incompatibilist sees that as a distinction without, the dif without a difference, right? Being able to do something such that were I to do it, a law would be broken, is just no better than being able to do something that is the breaking of a law, 
Right, so the, the incompatibilist sees a cost of compatibilism here, um, but the compatibilist doesn't. Now, here's my view for what it's worth. What would it be for that to be a distinction without a difference? Uh, well, it depends what kind of difference you're looking for. I think if what you're looking for is a kind of deep metaphysical difference between two kinds of ability, right, the weak ability and the strong ability, uh, if that's what you want, that's not what the compatibilist is offering, right? I think the compatibilist, like Lewis, for example, is offering a distinction here, right? And because it's a distinction, uh, there's a difference. Uh, but it's not a deep metaphysical distinction. I, right, no, so now Lewis... Uh, all right, I think probably if you need to accept this compatibilist way to go, you kind of need to be a human about laws. You need to think that breaking the laws is not like... The ability to break the laws is not, you know, magic, right? It's just, this is what happens at nearby possible worlds. The laws are just axiomatizations of the stuff that happens in the universe. They're just not, metaphysically, they're not, as it were, there in the fundamental fabric of reality. So, yeah, the distinction between a weak ability and a strong ability is not a deep metaphysical distinction, right? Uh, so if that's what you want, then, yeah, you're not going to see a difference there. You're going to see a distinction without a difference. Um, I think uh, Lewis sees a distinction that, you know, thereby constitutes a difference because it's a distinction. Um, I actually uh, am inclined to think that the particular way that he goes in local, in Are We Free to Break the Laws is not the best way to do this because I think that it just turns, I mean, he just stipulates that we don't have strong abilities, right? I, that's just stipulation for Lewis. I don't think um, there's any way for his view to uh, give us anything like a kind of story about why that stipulation why we should think that that's true. Um, and I actually think that the way to go is to have a conditional account of abilities and then that, kind of, that distinction is kind of enforced by that sort of account, but that's all by the way. So, the incompatibilist sees a cost of compatibilism here, right? Uh, <laughs> being able to do something such that words do it will be broken, just that's no better than being able to do something that is the breaking of the law. It's sort of, both of them are just, you, you're able to break the laws, that's just, uh, no. Um, but I don't think, or at least the kind of compatibilist that I am, and I think the kind of compatibilist that Lewis was, although he never specifically said anything on this topic, um, uh, I think at least if you're a human about laws, uh, there's no cost here, right? You already signed up to a view about laws according to which this is not going to enshrine any deep metaphysical distinction. Uh, there are ways of defining what it is to be able to do such and such, such that it turns out that we can do one kind of thing and not the other. There we go, that's good enough. Uh, we're being driven here, right? When, when Lewis, I think when Lewis says, look, uh, no one's able to uh, perform a miracle, uh, he thinks of that as part of common sense, right? That's just part of our common sense view of the world. He cares about common sense. He, that's one of his, you know, one of his list of uh, stuff you shouldn't mess around with too much is common sense, right? So he endorses common sense opinions. Uh, so he needs it to be the case that we can't perform miracles, but as it were, he doesn't, he doesn't care about giving a deep metaphysical story for why that is, right? He just wants to preserve common sense. And I think that's not what's going on with the incompatibilist at all. Uh, what the incompatibilist wants is a, in order to buy that distinction is a, is a proper deep metaphysical difference, and there just isn't one. Okay, so... Conclusion, if we consider the matter, as Benin Walker does in a Lewisian spirit, uh, the incompatibilist commitment to that premise, I can't render false the laws, pans out as follows. We've got two options. The first option is to deny the counterfactual dependence of the laws on what we do. Uh, I think there's a definite cost to that. You've got no theory of counterfactuals. That's bad. Uh, the other thing you could do is, is hold on to the idea that the laws counterfactually depends on what we do and just, you know, insist that, indeed, insist that for that reason we're not able to do those things, right? Because uh, if the laws counterfactually depend on what we do, then we'd better not be able to do otherwise because then we'd be able to do stuff that would constitute breaking laws. Um, from an incompatibilist point of view, denying that claim, ooh, uh, what have I said here? Yes, cost-free, right? Uh, has a benefit, right? You deny that you're able to do that thing, such that were you to do it, the laws would be different. Um, that's got a good benefit, not able to break the laws. Brilliant, that's the result we want uh, if we're a compatibilist, if an incompatibilist of a certain kind, right? So, cost-free to go this way, great. 
uh, from a compatibilist point of view, it's asserting that claim that's cost free, right? Uh, being able to do something such that had they done it a law would have been broken is absolutely fine. Uh, maybe you have to be a human about laws to be fine with that, but again, I don't see that as a cost, and Lewis would not have seen it as a cost. Uh, it also has a massive benefit. Determinism is no barrier to acting freely. Of course, if you're someone like Dirk Pearboom, you'll think of that as a cost rather than a benefit, right? But uh, compatibilists tend to think, uh, tend to be pleased that it turns out that free will is compatible with determinism rather than disappointed. So, I think we're in this position now, a slightly less hostile version of, of, of that position. Um, uh, whether there's a cost associated with asserting or denying that claim is not something I think that you can establish. Right, what the costs and benefits are are not things that you can establish uh, independently of a whole load of other philosophical views that you have a, about a whole load of other things. Right? We need a theory of counterfactuals. You might have a, a Humean or a non-Humean view about laws of nature. You, know, you might have a view about whether acting freely is a good thing or a bad thing. All of these things are going to play into your attitude to whether or not that's a cost and benefit. There's just no, as it were, independent way of determining that question, as it were, just by staring really hard at the consequence argument. That's not going to help you at all. The issues are much broader than that. Um, and I think it just can't be established, as it were, from a neutral point of view who has the biggest cost to bear, because whether you think you're bearing a cost or a benefit depends on uh, the view that you started out with. So, stalemate, that's my conclusion.